but of course, I don't know. I don't know. I think this time, I know this time I'm going to do it Cindy's way because there's yeah. so much snow. I don't. It's going live snow. now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning. It's Friday, February fourth, ten thirty nine a.m. This is the second half of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee morning meeting. Um, we are here to. Uh, continue our conversation of priority housing projects. And Ms. Tchaikovsky, you are gonna help us walk through a uh, document that helps people determine if they do or do not have a priority housing project in front of them. Sure. <clears throat> uh, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Is it the, is it the flow chart? <laughs> yes, it is a flow chart. Good, okay. So this is a document that the NRB created. It's on their website. They actually have two different flowcharts. Um, and the one that I'm showing you right now is for locations that have an existing permit on it. Um, the other one is just uh, for, for parcels that don't have an Act 250 permit on it already. And you can, it's a very similar document, but um, this has the additional step of what happens if there's an existing permit that may need to be amended. Um, and so I do want to take a step back and maybe frame this issue a little bit. So you have, I think, received multiple bills that are proposing amendments to the structure of how the priority housing project exemption under Act 250 works. Um, it does currently have a very specific set of criteria that does um, that is reminiscent of a Russian, a Russian nesting doll because there are definitions within the definitions. Um, and so I also have this, I did put it out verbally instead of uh, visually in a, in a slide and we can look at that if that would be helpful if you wanna see the specific language. Um, but there are multiple elements that are required in order for a project to be considered a priority housing project. And if a project is a priority housing project, it is exempt from Act 250. So first step is, is the project within a designated area? And uh, I believe talked about this a little bit in your committee this session, but we haven't gone totally in depth. There are five designations under the state designation program. There are three core designations and there are then two overlaid uh, designations that can be added to a town if they have their core designation. And so this is something that the municipality applies for. There are, there are requirements in statute and they are, um, it, it designates the, the core commercial center in a town. So you can find designated areas on the Vermont Planning Atlas, um, but also ACCD's website has a lot of information about um, these designated areas, where they're located, what kind of incentives are, are available for them. Um, on a quick aside, I did wanna mention one thing based on what Chair Haskell brought up. So she did mention that it seems like most of the priority housing projects are located in three counties. Um, and so I haven't looked at the data, but that would not surprise me because the designated areas are not evenly distributed across the state. And in fact, there isn't a, there aren't, if you exclude village centers, there are not that many of, of the other designated areas and a large percentage of them are in Chittenden County. So that is one thing to note about this. Um, priority housing projects require that the project be in a designated area and they are not uniformly spread through the state. So is the project in a designated area? If it's not, stop, it's not a priority housing project. If it is, you ask if there's an existing uh, Act 250 permit on the site. If so, you have to go to flow chart number two because as you know, Act 250 permits, once they attach to a parcel, exist in perpetuity and Act 250 jurisdiction covers that site. 
If a project is in a designated area, you have to then ask which designation it is. And that is partially um, due to the, the comment I made earlier about the distinction between what, based on where it's located, a priority housing project has different characteristics. So first on the, the far right box here, village centers. Village centers without a designated neighborhood development area do not qualify for the priority housing project exemption. So village centers only do not get to take advantage of this priority housing project exemption. Neighborhood development areas or Vermont neighborhoods. Um, Vermont neighborhoods, that program got sort of swallowed up by the, the NDA program. And so there aren't technically speaking, Vermont neighborhoods anymore. They're, they're now called designated uh, neighborhood development areas. So those are the same thing. But those projects are required to just be housing projects uh, consisting of mixed income. So when you go down that chart, you see that it says, is it a mixed income project? Uh, is the project mixed income? If it's not, it's not a priority housing project. If it is, you got to go down to the next level. In the other designated areas, downtowns, new town centers, growth centers, or village centers that do have a neighborhood development area, the project can either be mixed use or mixed income. And those do have defined terms in Act 250. If it isn't one of those two types of projects, then no, it is not a priority housing project. And can you briefly uh, fill the committee in on what Act 250 means by mixed use and mixed income, please? Sure. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and put up a different document. Uh, if I can, there it is. Okay, so can you see a slide that has the definition of mixed income projects on it? Yes. Okay, so this is a defined term. So mixed income housing is a housing project that's made up of either owner occupied housing or rental housing. And then there's slightly different definitions for either of them, um, but Owner occupied housing, you know, is when a developer is going to put in a bunch of um, single family units, probably potentially, or um, maybe condos, but they, they're going to be purchased, not rented. And so it's either 15% of the units or 20% of the units are affordable. And then for rental housing, it's 20% of the the housing units are affordable housing. Uh, mixed use is construction of mixed income housing and a commercial space. So either retail, office, services, recreational community, um, provided that at least 40% of the floor area is dedicated to housing. So if we go back to the flowchart mentally, the neighborhood development areas only allow for mixed income housing, meaning the projects that can be exempt are housing projects only. And the other designated centers, which are the, the core designated centers near the commercial centers, you're allowed to do mixed income or mixed use projects that allow for a mix of commercial retail and housing units to be part of the project. How are we doing on that? Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Okay. And um, can a project, so a project can be more than one building, right? Oh, so it's yes. floor area. So you could have, I don't know, uh, you could have separate commercial buildings surrounded by separate um, residential structures. And as long as that entire project didn't give over 
more than 40% of the floor area to commercial or whatever, non-residential um, spaces, it, it can qualify. Close, it's gotta be at least 40% is housing. So, okay. yeah. Um, and then, of course, the Assume, Mr. Chair, oh, yeah. Senator McDonald. Just um, I was curious about the 20 percent of the housing has to be affordable and which means that 80 percent of the housing doesn't have to be affordable. Is Correct. That the, or it simply can be something else. Uh, yes, something else. It does not have to be affordable. And, and if I think you were in an area that was designated for housing only, and that, and the requirement was that twenty percent had to be affordable, then the other eighty percent, um, I, I don't know how that's a step forward. Um, so yes, are we not? I just don't know how that's a step forward. So, okay, thank you, thank you. No, and 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 I think when they created this definition, there was a negotiation here because I think you could you would hear from developers potentially that developing a housing project there needs to be a mix of affordable and market rate apartments in order to make the the project itself affordable. So I do think that this was a negotiated ratio. But yes, when we use mixed income housing for in the priority housing project definition, it is not 100% units are affordable. That's not what the standard is. So as a, I guess it's for the question for the committee, as a, once you have put one of these projects in place and have created it and it's been built, you now have um, greater inequity between new housing between them um, or a less of an inequity? That's my question. Are you talking just for clarification <clears throat> between the, the various people that are living there? No, has the, has the available housing that has been added to the community yep. um, ended up with more affordable housing than before the project or less affordable oh, housing see. than before the project? I do think the affordable housing advocates could provide you more information on this. I have heard testimony in other committees that because priority housing projects are exempt from Act 250, developers are interested in pursuing them. And so there is an incentive by being exempt from Act 250. And so at least 20% of the units are going to be affordable. And my question is, is that a net gain or is that just slowed down the, um, the current trend of building only for wealthy, of, of builders concentrate, uh, preferring or choosing to build for um, folks that, that want to build big houses? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Given our goals, that would be an interesting question to have answered. Um, Senator McDonald, can you restate your question? I just want to make sure I'm hearing it clearly. Currently, when builders accept contract to, contracts to construct housing, they tend to go for people to building larger houses that have people that have a good deal of money and who want to build them in places that um, don't fit with smart growth. Um, that's the current trend, which has led to why we don't have affordable housing because people don't, they don't build it. Um, if we require that any project that is beneficiary of of uh, these incentives must do 20% of the housing they build must be affordable. 
that also means that they can build 80% that's not affordable. Um, should we be subsidizing a system which 80% of which goes to builders to build housing that isn't affordable? Should that be our subsidy? Um, or should we limit our subsidy to um, the housing that's actually um, affordable? Okay. Well, so I think I would ask, just so I more fully understand what you're contemplating, in what form are you using the term subsidy, right? a waiver of Act 250 proceedings that does entail some costs, could be the, the savings there might be treated as a subsidy. Is that what you're referring to by subsidy? Well, I subsidy, and, subsidy and incentive are, um, yeah, so are the same thing. If you incent them, you are all, when we look at what we're proposing, it's always, well, it'll cost you less. Um, you don't have to build, a, you know, you may not have to pay sales tax. You may have to do this. We'll uh, waive permit, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all monetary. Um, we're not offering plaques that you can put up on the wall to thank people for having constructed affordable housing. We're offering them um, monetary advantages to change their behavior. Um, call it what you want. Okay. No, I just wanted to make sure I knew what you were thinking about. Um, the, yeah, I also think that these definitions in terms of the thresholds have altered over years. For instance, the percentage of homes that must be quote unquote affordable. And I think the term for how long the duration of affordability, I think has been shortened over time as well. Um, you know, as part of a back and forth to provide incentives or subsidies to get people well, to do more of this. Um, we, well, we had a policy for years where we had 20 years, the housing has to be affordable. So the owners would, you know, they were incented to build the house. They owned it. And after 20 years, they issued the eviction notices and then rehab them, put in new appliances and sold them as condos or sold them as uh, individual you know, units. Um, that's, that is our history. Um, are we repeating that or, or are we not? Okay. Um, Senator Westman. So you're um, one of the things that I would be interested in is what we're um, what affordable means now and what we're talking about. Um, in as you talk about your terms, um, um, what are um, what are the income levels in the um, as they relate um, to that. I see the numbers, but what are what dollars does that translate into? Great question, because that is another defined term that is part of this definition. I so, know. yeah, so the, the the definition of affordable housing as it's being used here is in uh, subdivision twenty nine of six thousand and one, and so I don't have the dollar amounts in front of me, but this is something you did look at. So for owner, or it, this is another change that's in, I think S270, um, but currently it reads owner occupied housing for which the total cost of housing uh, of ownership includes principal interest, taxes, insurance, condo fees does not exceed 30% of the gross annual income at a household at 120% of the highest of the following. County median income, as defined by HUD. Standard metropolitan statistical area median income or statewide median income. Um, and then it's almost identical for rental housing, except for that it's 30% of the gross annual income of a household at 80% of the highest of the following. 
And so what that means is that it does differ county to county because county median income is different across the state. So it depends on the specific county that the project is going to be located in. Uh, for me, I would just say that the slippery slope in all of these terms now is that what we used to consider middle class families and particularly lower middle class families that um, um, and getting them in housing, it's become harder and harder and harder for them to um, um, find housing and they would be above these categories. I think, and particularly if we saw it in terms of not percentages of that, but if we saw what the numbers really meant. Um, any? Thank you. There's thank one final aspect. Thank, that thank you, Sandra touched. West. Um, there's another, there's one final aspect of this definition that we haven't talked about yet, but I think you all are very aware of is that there's a cap on the number of units you can be, that you can build of, a, of these priority housing projects in order to remain exempt. And currently it is based on the size of the town that you're in. So uh, towns with less than 3000 uh, people, it's 25 units and under are exempt. Towns 3,000 to 6,000, it's 50 units, are up to 50 units are exempt. Towns 6,000 to 10,000, 75 units, up to 75 units are exempt. Uh, towns with a population of, of more than 10,000, there is no cap. So that is, a, that is another dimension of that. And that was the final um, box on the, the flow chart is, are your, is your project going to have be below the number of units that um, that is required. Uh, all right. Um, well, thank you. Um, um, and I don't know what you're thinking about schedule. There, there are more elements to this because there, it does, when you start to look at um, if there's a, if there's an existing permit on the site, there's another dimension to that as well. So um, I don't know if you wanna shift gears at this point to another topic, but this, um, yeah. Um, well, how much time will we need to sort of finish? I don't wanna just sort of rush through other things that you think are fundamentals that we should know. Um, all right, then I'll just touch on this process. So there's a, if there's an exit, so, so currently priority housing projects do not require a permit or a permit amendment. And there's this, uh, some language about that in section 6081. Um, section 6081-0 also does say that if a designation, if a town loses their designation, um, subsequent subsequent changes to priority housing projects do need to get permits. So there's that. Um, but then also um, for permit amendments um, for downtown development districts, as long as it qualifies and meets the definition, it is fully exempt. For priority housing projects in other designated centers, and this is um, the, the last paragraph on this page, um, it's P2. Uh, if a priority housing project that has an act, if, if there is a site that has an Act 250 permit that exists and a developer is proposing to turn that site into a priority housing project, if they're going to comply with the existing permit conditions that are attached to the site, the priority housing project can go forward and it is exempt from needing a permit amendment. However, if they are going to violate the conditions in the existing Act 250 permit, there is a process um, in 6084 that they have to go through in order to um, change the permit conditions to address the priority housing project. Um, 
And so if the applicant can uh, receives consent of all of the original parties to the permit, um, the project can move forward with an amendment without a notice and a hearing on the amendment. Um, if they are not able to obtain consent from the prior parties, um, they have to file a permit application, um, but that is then limited to whether the changes to the conditions um, enable positive findings to be made under the criteria. So it's a, it's a more limited review, but it's not, um, it's not a full exemption. So that, that's another aspect of this. this this program, the Priority Housing Project program is a little bit complicated. There's a, there's a number of elements here. Um, and the other thing that Allison had mentioned is that if there's historic buildings on the, on the site, they do have to get permission um, and a letter from the, the Division of Historic Preservation um, in order to move forward with any demolition or changes to historic buildings, so. Thank you very much. Any committee questions for Ms. Tchaikovsky? So I didn't figure we would master this flow chart, but I just wanted us to uh, be aware of the kind of choices and parameters that come up in it so that as we look at the bill going forward next week, that we'll have in mind, uh, you know, sort of check boxes that we would want to consider. So thank you very much for that. Um, and with that, um, on this same area, Act 250, we've talked about how to our regret and alarm, you know, we're still seeing the loss of forest land and, and a 11 to 15,000 acres a year. And um, although the housing and ARPA dollars component of the, our Act 250 work uh, has been front and center, we don't want it to take all the oxygen out of the room. And I had asked Mr. Fidel to come back and talk to us about things we might consider and perhaps even have considered previously in this committee and in the General Assembly for uh, strengthening our work on forestry. Um, so thank you, Mr. Fidel for coming back in and the floor is yours. Thank you, Senator Brain. Thank you all uh, for having me back. It's, uh, it's always an important topic. Enjoy having the opportunity to talk to you about it. And um, as, as has already been discussed, this, is, this has been an issue that's been covered by the committee for many years. And I've uh, submitted some written testimony, not, not to go through it verbatim with you. I just wanted you to have the background. I tried to compile a lot of the history of, of the attention to addressing uh, the issue of forest fragmentation in particular through Act 250, recognizing that your committee has also done work outside of Act 250 to try and address the issue, issue such as uh, passing Act 171 several years ago that boosted the planning that happens at the town plan level to recognize the importance of forest blocks. And recently, um, last month, I reported to you that there was a, we were actually making some progress on that front, but we're still measuring the gaps that are happening more on the, the regulatory side through the land use review. And so looking at this issue through the lens of Act 250 is, is still really important. Um, I think that there's been really a growing consensus of the, the gaps in Act 250 related to forest. I, I, I hope that we're, we're past the point of, of actually asking whether for, you know, Act 250 is doing an adequate job to review impacts the forest. And now the conversation has been more about what would be the right policy to try and encourage smart growth you know, in our forest, recognizing that the criteria that you've always looked at has never said, we're saying no to development in forests, but as we continue to subdivide them, what's the pattern look like? How do we try and encourage a, a thoughtful approach to, to developing in our forest? And we have actually had multiple grants where we've actually brought engineers and land use planners together and dug mock done mock exercises of subdivisions. And we often hear from the leading engineers in the state that um, this is not a new concept for them. They know how to plan development well in forest. It's just a question of when it gets to the scale of Act 250, whether I guess we're gonna make it matter. Um, so in my testimony, I've, I've kind of just, I'll just quickly highlight, you have the statistics 
in my testimony and from other great reports that have been submitted, you know, from the Agency of Natural Resources and BNRC and the Forest Service. It's well documented that we are losing our forests. We're losing it at a rate that's noticeable. Um, and if we keep on projecting out, we're going to lose a lot of our forests more than I think we'd like. And so that's uh, those numbers are here in my testimony. We're also documenting that we're continuing to continue to parcelize, continue to fragment our landscape through development and undeveloped woodland as a land use category that's tracked through grand list data collected for property tax purposes shows that our undeveloped woodland is the category that we're losing the fastest in Vermont. More than farmland, more than any other land use classification, that's the one that, that we're losing at the fastest clip and it's changing to a residential, residential status. Um, it's been 15 years of studying the issue of forest fragmentation in Act 250. I think I've talked to you before, even going back to 2007, the Forest Roundtable report that we developed highlighted the gap in Act 250. We developed the Forest Fragmentation Action Plan with many state agencies and leaders in the planning community. Again, one of the top identified strategies was to modify Act 250 to address forest fragmentation if we want to hold on to this pattern of maintaining viable forest land base in Vermont. As you know, the Vermont legislature has actually convened three reports on this topic. Um, Commissioner Snyder has offered you a report on the status of progress made on a number of those recommendations. Those reports have consistently flagged the, the gaps in Act 250 and recognize that there are policy solutions along the lines of what you're, what you're studying, <clears throat> what you're looking at in this bill. So I do wanna highlight here just again, um, before then quickly getting into um, one suggested language um, proposal for you to consider, is we actually have done research at Act 250. I don't recall, it may have been a couple of years since I've actually shared these, these results with you. Um, but we actually looked at 22 case study towns. We actually combed through all the subdivision records as a way to try and understand how many subdivisions are actually going through Act 250 in Vermont. Um, and what we found, and it was actually really surprising, um, but these were uh, sort of a diverse representation of communities. We didn't try and, you know, we, we had an objective lens. We used a, a criteria that would try and get at different types of communities, some resorts, some more rural. We weren't just trying to, you know, create a predetermined outcome. Um, this particular study from looked at 22 towns from 2003 to 2009, or 925 subdivisions created, with um, 2,749 lots were created through the subdivisions, affecting a total of 70,827 acres. Only one to two percent of the subdivisions were large enough to trigger Act 250 meaning they had to be either six lots in a town that doesn't have zoning regulations or 10 or more lots in a town that does have subdivision regulations. The average was two to four lots. And that's not that surprising because I mean, we often hear from people, well, what are you talking about? We're not seeing these large subdivisions. Yes, in certain resort areas, Chittenden County, certain areas, we are seeing larger subdivisions. That's because the pattern in Vermont is, is sort of a two to four lot subdivision. Um, and those are under the, the jurisdiction of Act 250. And that's the incremental development though that has cumulative impacts that then has the, the, the overall cumulative um, degree of these land use change, changes that we're seeing. Um, and so your committee and the house have wrestled with, you know, if there's a need to first try and encourage smart growth through the Act 250 review process in forest, develop our criteria, but then say, you know, well, how does the criteria get applied when we're going to have projects that can have an unduly fragmenting effect? There's been a couple of options that have been considered. Um, one is potentially just having automatic jurisdiction and locations, and that's hard because people then feel like, wow, I'm just automatically in Act 250 regardless of what my development is. And so we've encouraged perhaps a study of that, of how it would work. How would you prioritize the areas within a certain automatic jurisdictional approach? But there have been con conversations in particular in the House when they did work on the large Act 250 bill that came to you a couple of years ago. And uh, the other is option is to change the number of lots that would trigger a review. Ellen provided a really nice side-by-side -side of H233 from years ago, and now what's in this bill, you know, back 
you know, years ago, you were considering lowering the number of lots as a, num as a, as a different idea. Where we've kind of settled is, is this idea of re-examining, you know, what used to be called the road rule, but it's some kind of incursion, you know, review. Because developers, applicants, people who are deciding to develop in intact forest have choices. You know, they can develop right into the heart of that forest block, or they can develop, you know, closer to the margins of where existing development is located. And we think that a fair way to, to kind of add some jurisdictional review is to say, well, if you're going to go inc have an incursion of a certain length into an area, then you would trigger review. But if you're doing planning that's sort of aligned with our statewide you know, planning goals of having more compact related development or development that's closer to existing development, then you wouldn't trigger Act 250. So that kind of gets us to, you know, what's in this bill is, is that concept, um, whatever we call it, you know, I'd like to think of it more as like an incursion policy. Um, right now though, you know, or the way it used to work is you would have to have a road of 800 feet in length, um, as many of you may, may remember. And what you have in the bill now is you would need 2000 feet in order to trigger. So a road or a driveway, what's an improvement in the bill now is you're considering roads and driveways. Driveways was a big loophole in the road rule before because we weren't necessarily triggering roads, but people were defined as a driveway coming off of a road and then it doesn't you know, capture review. So the smart thing in the bill is you're, you're, you're keen on sort of these distinctions between roads and driveways and looking at them both. The suggestion we have is 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 perhaps to have parity with the length as it as it as it existed before for an individual road um, or driveway. So it's 800 feet, but then stick with the 2,000 feet if you're talking about a cumulative subdivision, um, because as you know, then the density could get to a point where you do want to have a review if you're talking about subdivisions with multiple roads or driveways. So really, the only new concept that that we're suggesting that you think about is um, you know, perhaps tightening up or at least having parity with, with, the, with the way the, 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 the rule used to, to operate for one single, single road or driveway trigger in review, the length of that incursion in that case. This all is underscored by the fact that if you add forest fragmentation criteria to the bill, which is a great step that we you know, really support. And I you know, forgot to mention before that um, I'm testifying on behalf of BNRC and all the work we've done on this issue, but there's also the Forest Partnership that's made up of Audubon, Vermont, and the Nature Conservancy, and a Trust for Public Land, and Vermont Land Trust, um, and um, Vermont Conservation Voters, and you have in my testimony, all the organizations have long supported um, these measures too. And so um, it's that we can strengthen the criteria, but it may not be applicable in all that many cases because of the fact that a lot of subdivisions don't trigger review. So it's only gonna be large commercial development that may occur or the largest of subdivisions if you don't have a jurisdictional mechanism. And so really do appreciate your consideration of, you know, both how do we look at essentially understanding where we do want to improve our ability to have growth occur where it should occur in an, in an efficient way, but also what do we do about the rural land base that is, that really we're seeing these problematic trends and there does need to be some kind of jurisdictional attention to that. So that is, um, that's the policy proposal that we have for you. Happy to answer any questions. Um, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to also speak to the, the sections 13 and 14 related to wood products manufacturing, if that kind of fits into the forestry, um, sections that you wanted me to speak to. Sure. Um, well, so let's pause just for a moment. Um, any questions on what Mr. Fidel's already gone over? All right, so seeing none, let's go on to the next uh, wood products sections too, thank you. You know, for many years, we've been reviewing uh, some of these policies as well. I would say in general, we do believe that having a viable and sustainable forest products industry in Vermont is important. It's important to maintaining, keeping forests as forests. It's important to our economy. It's important that the forestry be done well, um, but that we do, we do support efforts to try and understand 
uh, if we want to maintain forestry and forestry in Vermont, that there, there, there can be a look at Act 250. The question is how far the, the policies swing. And so, for example, in the House right now, through the Rural Economic Development Working Group's omnibus bill, there's a proposal to actually outright forest processing from, from Act 250 review. Um, many years ago in the Senate, actually in the, in the Agriculture Committee, when Senator Starr was doing work on this, we actually supported taking forest processing and moving certain uh, board feet of processing down to a minor consideration as, as a way to help. But our testimony was never intended at that point to support just outright exempting it. And so exemptions, outright exemptions are really difficult policy because then you're potentially taking neighbors in communities and, and you're, you're reducing their ability to actually address valid issues and environmental impacts that need to be addressed. So, but there have been a lot of conversations about ways to help with hours of operation, which is valid. If we want to encourage operations in the winter, when there's less environmental impact and wood needs to move, then we get it. We understand that there should be considerations about how to help in that regard. Um, so we do think that there are some legitimate issues here. We have historically supported um, these, these sections that are in here because they, we find they're balanced. They do help, they will help maintain the viability of the industry, but also still preserve some of the bedrock abilities of neighbors to address what would be legitimate issues. And so our concern is them going too far and be turning into outright exemptions. Um, in my written testimony, and I guess I'll say it here, we're growing exasperated at uh, showing up to help uh, the industry with issues that are important to them only to see them take the seat in your committee and others and oppose the forest fragmentation provisions. We don't see how you maintain a viable forest products industry without maintaining a viable land base as it's being chewed up and subdivided every year. Um, we talk to many people in the industry who believe we have to maintain our rural land base. And um, if the goal of some, not certainly not you as legislators, but if the goal of some are to request that you move the forest processing provisions and even turn them into exemptions and then kill the forest plantation piece, as has happened on the floor of the Senate before, then VNRC will oppose the bill. Um, okay, and I see that you have that you have sent um, me language that relates to your suggestion on the modification to the road rule. So I'll um, forward that on to the committee and as well as to uh, Ms. Chakowsky and. Um, uh, my, we really, well, let me, let me just pause because maybe we can take care of this, make a decision as a committee on this right now. I think it's, a, um, a, I'm a little concerned about trying to share a screen. I have too many screens open. Um, do, do we have, um, this should, this should be fun. <laughs> We'll see. Adventures and screen sharing. Jude, can you make it so I can? Let me ask Ms. Tchaikovsky if she already has this language. I think I might have forwarded it to you. Uh, uh, Jamie's proposed road, road rule language? Yes. 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 Okay. You have it. Great. If you could put it up in front of the committee, that would be helpful. Sure. Okay, can you see it? It's probably small. No, it's, it's uh, great, yes. thank you. Okay. Uh, or which in combination, okay. So the original road rule was 800 feet, correct? So we're preserving that length and then we're saying if uh, if driveways and roads in combination though can't exceed two thousand linear feet, so it's a little more clear of exactly how we're doing the measurement. Otherwise, in essence, we would have said a driveway 
could have become that would have triggered under the old world rule at 800 feet now could be 2000 feet long before it would ever trigger, um, which seems more, uh, less sensitive to incursion. And as a practical measure of how far is 2000 feet, when we were talking about this, I think two years ago, um, I used Google Maps and, you know, that equals standing in front of the state capitol, walking down State Street till you hit the light at Main Street, taking a right. And by the time you get to approximately Sarducci's, you've hit 2,000 feet. So it is a, a very long driveway in, in, indeed before you'd ever trigger any kind of review. So what's the committee's pleasure? Is this something in the next draft of the bill that people would welcome the yes. addition of? Yes. Okay. Senator yeah. McCormick, Senator McDonald. At Senator minimum, at bare minimum for him. Right, 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 right. Right. It, right. So uh, what we're contemplating here is in some cases going to the 2000 foot standard or so in 926, a, a year ago, I guess it was, I'm yeah. losing track what's two, going on. Two years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's like Groundhog Day on Act 250. The, the, the road rule was proposed to be reinstated but uh, at 2,000 feet, but it was talking about roads and driveways in combination. So you couldn't finesse it and say, well, this is a driveway, so don't count it. It's not a road. Um, but it meant, but, you know, so that seemed like a positive thing. I think what I don't think we considered at the time is another way to interpret it is that, well, your driveway is a single road and um, it could now be up to 2000 feet long, which is uh, not, which is particularly, you know, it's like going the wrong way in terms of trying to um, yeah, yeah. age Act 250 in a thoughtful way. Yeah, I mean, I just think 2,000 feet is, is, is too long to, to go without um, regulation, without permitting. Okay. So I see two members of the committee who are interested in editing our bill to make that clarification here. Um, Senator McDonald, is that something you support? Yeah, I, I said what we just gotten was the bare minimum and several of them, I think were negotiated in previous years in order to part of compromises. Right. And then the bill was vetoed. I, I would figure that the compromises were vetoed also. We shouldn't, that shouldn't be our starting point. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Those were those those were things that we didn't think we ought to permit, but we did anyway in exchange for moving a bigger project forward. And it didn't get moved forward; it got torpedoed. Um, so I don't want to start there, but I don't want to end up there. So that's why I say a minimum. Okay, All right. Well, so this is better than where we last landed. Um, Senator Westman, any thoughts on making this clarification? Uh, we better have testimony. Yes. Okay. All right. So let's put it in and, uh, and then we'll take testimony, which is the right way to proceed, period. All right. So it's 1127 and it's Friday. So that means we're on the floor in three minutes. So thank you, everyone, for... Uh, covering like three different topics this morning, moving around a little bit. It's always a little challenging. And 